first we're going to uh, get our room set up with our chairs and stuff in there for the ladies conference and don't forget that that's coming up it's here it's this Saturday and it will start at 10 o'clock and it'll end about 3 o'clock and so if you want to be a part of that and when we hope you are we we want this thing to be a church-wide thing and we're so thankful for all the people that have helped so far and they've worked so hard and um, we are just uh, looking forward to it it's here so uh, tonight we just need to move some chairs and set up some tables and then Friday night ladies you can come and set up your tables uh, I pick up the um, tablecloths Friday uh, morning I'll have them and they'll be here and so don't worry about your dishes the men will not wash your dishes if you don't want us to wash them we won't break them I promise if you want us to we'll scrape the food in the trash and leave them on your table whatever you want us to do we want to do that we understand we got to keep them separate because we want to make sure that you get your stuff back and everything but Friday night uh, will be the night where you can set up your decorate your table and anything we can do to help you that's what we're here for okay so if you can help us tonight before you go home it won't take us very long we'll just need to set up the tables and kind of get an idea about what we're going to do we're going to take a whatever stuff's in some of the two of those rooms and put it all in that one little room and then the ladies can have their room to do whatever okay all right don't forget this uh, November the 6th I think it is yes is the Sunday of the Thanksgiving dinner and uh, we'll start trying to see if some of you guys would like to cook a turkey then let us know we'll get you a turkey or a ham or something like that and and then the 19th is a Saturday and we're going to have a memorial service and a lunch for the family for Sherry Foster. Okay, so that's coming up. All that stuff's coming up, and it's exciting times. But I'm excited about this ladies' fall retreat because um, I just think that it might touch a lot of ladies, and that's what we want to do is touch lives, and uh, I appreciate you guys, and it's going to be a blast. It's always fun. So tonight, we're in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, we're winding up Hebrews. I hope you've enjoyed the book. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Before we get started, I found this today I thought was interesting. I wanted to show you. Uh, Kenny, did you get that article? Here's your tax dollars. CDC allotted $85 million in grants for schools to start gay-straight alliance groups. Now, what this what a gay straight alliance group is I didn't know what it was but it's an LGBTQ group um, in a public school now 85 million dollars um, to start an LGBT uh, group in your public school for high schools and middle schools now I don't know of any uh, federal dollars that's ever went for a Christian group in a public school. But this is interesting. The U.S. Center of Disease and Control and Prevention spent $85 million on a grant program requiring public schools to start Gay Straight Alliance public uh, document show. Now, my question is, what does the Center of Disease and control have to do with the uh, LGBTQ group in a public school. The name of the thing is the Center for Disease Control. Uh, I've taught this for 30 years. Why is it called the Center of Disease Control? Why is it called, why isn't it called the Center of Disease Prevention? are we controlling diseases or trying to, I just always thought that was a weird name but this is taking weirdom 
uh, to another level. I don't understand. I hope maybe some of y'all can. Why is tax dollars taken from us? You know the government don't have any money. You know CDC, they don't have any money. Uh, I don't understand why the Center of Disease Control would have anything to do with forming LGBTQ groups in public schools. Let's go down. I want to read something to you. Uh, the school must apply for the federal uh, money. Grant, once the school is deemed eligible, the school can be awarded anywhere from $12,000 to $350,000 for the program. For schools to be eligible for the grant, they must fulfill all of the required activities listed in the program guidelines and documents and cannot opt out of those requirements. According to the document, one of the required activities that school cannot opt out of requires the implementation uh, implementation of student-led clubs supporting LGBTQ youth, usually known as Gay-Straight Alliances. Uh, a Gay-Straight Alliance is a student-led club typically run in a middle or high school, which creates a safe place for students to socialize, support each other, discuss issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Now, wh why would you need money funded for that? You already have a school. You already, they go after school programs probably. The, they're already there. Teachers have to stay over, don't they? Why do you need money? Well, hang on, you'll find out. And uh, work to end homophobia and transphobia in their school. Now, what that means is you're afraid of a homosexual or you're afraid of a transgender. I've never met one yet I've been afraid of. I don't know about you. But anyway, they call you homophobic. And uh, to implement this activity, local education agencies will first need to determine which schools have CAS, uh, CSAs. LEA can then create and implement a plan for establishing gay-straight alliances in schools that do not already have them and strengthening gay-straight alliances in schools that do. Uh, the, CD, uh, the CDC lists the organization known as whatever as a potential resource to help with activities which encourage to use gender-neutral language. So this is all about teaching people how to uh, use the right pronouns. Go down a little bit, Kenny. I want to get to this one sentence. Uh, hang on a second. Here, professional development delivered to teachers and school staff annually should be addressed uh, fundamentally knowledge about. So that's where some of the money is going to go to pay for uh, teachers' further education about LGBTQ. There's where some money goes, right? Scroll on down, uh, if you will, Kenny. Thank you so much. Uh, here you go. The CDC also says that schools must oppose beliefs that are against the LGBTQIA or ideology. So in order to get the money, you got to be against. Well, let me read it to you again. Go, let's go back up there. The CDC, the Center of Disease Control, says that schools must oppose beliefs that are against the LGBTQ. IA ideology. That's your kid. I mean, hopefully. I mean, that's me. That's you. Huh. So anyway, I just thought that was really strange. I don't understand why the uh, Center of Disease Control has to do with putting clubs together in schools, but it does. So we're in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Now I want to uh, tell you this. The end of Hebrews... Uh, chapter 11 is about faith, and chapter 12 is known as the chapter about hope, and chapter 13 is finishes it off with love. So it's faith, hope, and love. And um, 
you can figure out it's the walk of faith uh, where the Bible talked about all the men and women that through faith in chapter 11 they did all these different things. It's the uh, wisdom of hope and the way of love. And so tonight we're in chapter 12. In chapter 12 you're going to find out some things that you don't find anywhere else in the Bible. And uh, I just think it's intriguing. So verse 1, look at this. Wherefore, seeing we, are, are, uh, we also are compassed about with a great a cloud of witnesses. Now, it, it, I don't think it's limited to the 16 names that are given in chapter 11, but I think it's talking about those heroes of the faith are watching you and cheering you on, okay? But so is everyone else in heaven, um, uh, especially your loved ones. A lot of people ask me throughout the years, can my mama see me on earth, you know, that's passed away, or can my daddy or can our children or something? And I believe there's plenty of Bible to tell you, yes, they can. Um, I'm not so sure that they just sit up there watching us like watching a TV all the time, but I think they can. Um, I think they have some kind of uh, knowledge about what's going on and about your life. I think they also pray. Listen, the Bible says Jesus prays for you. Uh, there's prayer in heaven, and I think your loved ones can pray uh, to God in heaven for you. And I don't know, um, sometimes doesn't, you, doesn't it seem like you feel like people are praying for you? I don't know. may not just be the people here on earth, but this verse tells you we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. They're not testifying against you. They're watching you. They're cheering you on. They're watching you see how you're doing. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now that word there, weight, uh, I didn't look up the Strong's or anything, but it's actually fat. And so I didn't want to give it any more uh, publicity, but what it's talking about is something that would slow you down or weight you down or make you heavy. If you've ever been uh, in the military and they have to, you know, do those hikes, but they have a 100-pound backpack, that's weighting you down. It makes it tougher for you to do what you need to do. And the sin, the sin just easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. So it starts off this chapter with a bang. You got some people watching you. Look at verse 2 through 4. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the writer here is encouraging you to think about when things get rough or things get tough, Think about heaven. Think about the finish line. Um, don't get bogged down in your day-to-day -day troubles. And uh, consider Jesus who uh, endured the cross. Go back to that verse, if you will, Kenny. He, what did he do? For the joy that was set before him. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of joy before the cross. Okay, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, one of these days I'm going to teach on that. You know, the Bible says that great drops of blood came out of his pores. That's a medical condition that can happen if you're under so, such amount of stress. But why does it happen to Jesus? It wasn't like Jesus was arguing with the God the Father because he didn't want to go to the cross. What is Gethsemane? What is that? The Bible says that uh, Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus said he came to die. Jesus said uh, no man could take his life. He laid down his life. So what is this thing going on in Gethsemane? 
He's acting out the Gethsemane for us. So why does he pray? Why does Jesus pray this prayer? Um, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. He prays it three times. And then he prays, not my will, but your will. Well, why does he pray that? He's not going to uh, shirk the cross. The cup he's talking about is the cup of wrath that God would pour out on Jesus. Now, Jesus is God. Don't forget this. So what he's trying to get in a display is there was no other way. There was no other way for God to redeem mankind than for Jesus, God himself, to lay down his life. Okay? Now, one of these days we'll teach on it. It's a very intriguing thing. People, people think that Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, and he's begging God, please just let me live out my life here on earth. Well, how long do you think he would have lived? <laughs> he's God. Uh, his blood doesn't have corruption. He is life, eternal. How long do you think he would have lived? Now, that's what I asked them in Chicago that time. They had that window about Mary's death. I said, well, how'd Mary die? They said, natural causes. I said, so uh, Mary the, was conceived immaculately, but she died of a cold? So Jesus isn't begging God the Father, please don't send me to the cross. He's showing you there's no other way. He's also showing you that he despised the sin that he would become. So um, I've always wondered who wrote down what he prayed because the disciples are sound asleep. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So use him as an example. For consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider Jesus when you think about um, the contradiction that he faced between him as a sinless uh, God in the flesh against uh, sinners that thought they were carrying out his assassination. What a contradiction. Should be a contradiction with you and sinners. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now, that was written at that time. Any of you in here ever resisted sin to the point of blood? Nah, me either. <clears throat> Any of you in here ever resisted sin? I don't know. I didn't know if you was listening or not. So, let's just set the record straight. We've been blessed I say this all the time. I don't know if anybody's listening. God had a reason why you were born in this time, in this place. When you were born in this nation of freedom. Now, this nation ain't perfect. Don't get me wrong. I teach. I just showed you uh, $85 million of your tax dollars that they rape from you is going to set up LGBT. I, I don't hide behind any of this patriotism or anything but you you need to count your blessings because for some reason God chose for you to be born in this nation with all of its faults and all of its evil it's the greatest nation ever been formed listen you don't like this nation go to some other one I've been to a few I, I couldn't wait to get back home if you don't like this time in history, go back to another one. How would you like to live at the time of Jesus? 
What would have been the worst thing for you to have lived at the time of Jesus? No TV, no telephone. What else? No electricity, no air conditioning, no toilet paper. I said it. I don't know who invented that, but I'm going to kiss him when I get to heaven. How do you think about it? We're spoiled. We're soft. We're spoiled. Oh, we think we're tough. But listen, God had a plan. God's not willy-nilly doing this thing. And God says that he takes the spirit of the person and puts it in the fertilized egg. Why did he, what was his plan? Why did he put you here in this place and at this time? He must have had some big expectations for you. Everything he does is according to growing his kingdom. And, and I think we will be held accountable for what we did with the gospel of Jesus Christ more than somebody, let's say, in his day. Um, they didn't have any way of spreading the gospel except mouth to mouth. And no car. You had a beast of burden and only few people had those. You had to walk. In Jesus' day, you, it meant you, if you were a Jew that you lost your family. Most of the time, it's people's family that keeps them from coming to church. But you don't lose your family in America when you uh, become a Christian. How about losing your job? How about losing your spouse? I'm convinced Paul lost his spouse. Uh, why? Why was we chosen to be here and now? I don't know. I think God had an ideal and a plan for us. So um, we're pretty spoiled. Look at verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. This is something I see in a lot of uh, TV preachers. They don't talk about the Lord like they're his son. They talk about the Lord like they're his equal. And they make some of the most outlandish statements. Kenneth Copeland said Jesus was the first born-again person on the planet. And when he went to hell, he came out born again. I don't know if the guy does uh, marijuana gummies or if he's just mentally, or if he's demon-possessed. I think he's demon-possessed. He went on to say in that clip that if Jesus hadn't have been born again and died for the sins of the world, he could have done it when he was. Kenneth Copeland could have done the same thing. The man's delusional heretical, if not demonic. But they talk about him like they're his equal. If you listen to Jesse Duplantis, he talks about Jesus like he's his buddy. I showed you the clip not too long ago where Jesse Duplantis says, uh, Jesus talks to me all the time, and, and uh, he'll say, Hey, Jesse, can you loan me some money? Now, He's not kidding. And uh, he, he'll say, Jesse, can you loan me some money? I need, I need a few bucks. Well, Jesus needs a few bucks? What this writer here is telling you is, you're a son and a daughter of God. I, you ought to keep that that way. Now, I don't know about you guys. You know, a lot of people, they want to be the friends with their with their children, I always told my boys, look, I got, I got friends. I don't need two more friends. You're not my friend. I don't want that relationship with them. I don't care how old they get. I don't care how old I get. I don't want that 
son and father relationship to ever become friends. I want to tell you something. In the Bible, the first time the word love is printed is the love between Abraham and his son. There is no greater love. It's a lesson thing for your kids to come up and become your equal. They should never become your equal. There should always be that level of respect. It's a way deeper love than your buddy. Watch what he says. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now listen, some of these parents, now none of you guys, but some parents today, they think it's love if, you know, they don't chasten their children. It's child abuse. And of course the kids like it. After a while, they love it. It's child abuse. I believe it's child abuse to give your kids everything they want. They're kids. They don't know what's best for them. Look, for whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. Well, there you go. That's a, that's a spiritual rule. If you love your children, you will chasten them. You say, how much? Whatever it takes to get the chastening done. You take your example... This writer told you, use Jesus as an example. Use God as an example. How far will God chase in a, one of his own? Anybody in here know? How far will God chase in his child? What would you say, Judy? To death. That's a fact. Now, listen, I'm not saying you ought to go strangle your kid but I mean maybe a little I hear people all the time just, you got to keep your mouth shut because you're trying to build a church not you know but they'll be like uh, Rufus he just wouldn't go to sleep last night well Rufus is poor you're like, what do you mean he wouldn't go to sleep last night? I don't know. He just wanted to play all night long. Well, he's a kid. I've told a lot of them. I said, now, if you'll hold little Rufus's head under a pillow till his little feet quit kicking, he'll go right off sleep. Which is a joke, of course, but I bet you if you uh, wore little Rufus's butt out in a pair of pajamas two or three times, he'd cry himself to sleep. But no, little Rufus it controls the whole house. And daddy and mama's got to get up and go to work with bags under her eyes because little Rufus wanted to play all night. No, no. That's what's wrong with us. We're in sad shape. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. Do you, everybody in here knows what a scourge is, don't you? It was a whip. Now, I'm not, you know, my uncles used to tell me my grandpa would whip them with the reins off of his plow horse. That'd be tough, man. And my uncle said, uh, you just had to stand there and take your whooping. And if you ran, those didn't count. The licks you got while you was running around, those didn't count. Those were just to get you to stop. So you just better off just to stand there with the reins off of a leather reins. And my uncle said he was trying to hit your butt, but he wasn't real accurate. But you, you know, they all turned out pretty good. I'm so just saying. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastement, whereof all are partakers, then you're a bastard and not sons. Do you know what that means? That means if you're lost and you're apart from God, God doesn't chasten you. 
You're your own worst enemy. You cause your own trouble. God has set laws in this earth, and they work against you. You get drunk, you're liable to have a wreck. You know, I mean, that stuff happens. It's not that God's swerving your car off in the ditch. But when you become his son or daughter, then he chastens you. But why? Now, this verse will come home to some of you. You don't have to agree. You just stand there and look straight ahead. But my mom used to say this. And we weren't ever going in somewhere fancy. It was usually Goodwill. And she'd say, all right, if you guys embarrass me in this store, and it's Goodwill, then I'm going to embarrass you. And we're like, okay, mama. And that's what this verse says. But God doesn't chasten you for that reason. He chastens you for you. Not because you're embarrassing him. You can't embarrass him. He chastens you because that's what you need. Watch. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and, and live? For they verily for a few days our fathers in the flesh chastened us after their own pleasure. You remember? My mama said, don't you embarrass me. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Well, you, nobody enjoys the chastening. Now, the great theologian Diana Banks says that in her own way. If you're spanking them and basically it doesn't hurt, <laughs> then that's not really spanking it. How do you say that, Diana? There you go. Well, yeah, that's what a whooping's for, you know. They're supposed to hurt. What? <laughs> Here you go, yeah. We call it hamlets. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Not chastening. I've seen kids laughing when their mom or dad was spanking them. Well, that's an oxymoron. I've said this before. My dad would spank you or whatever. It hurt, but it didn't harm us. But it's meant to hurt, ain't it? It's meant to hurt. We got these two puppies, and if I can catch them, I'm going to hurt them. They tear up another thing. Well, they're not going to know they're not supposed to tear it up unless when I kick them, I kick them hard enough to hurt, right? Now I got everybody mad at the gaze and the feet of but if, but if you don't, I mean, if you don't make it hurt, it doesn't register in their brain. Hey, maybe I need to quit tearing this stuff up. Having a building built, these three Hispanic guys get there today, said, Senor, do you have uh, availability to electric? I said, yeah. It's over there on the back of the house. He said, does your puppies bite? I said, no but don't let them out. He said, oh, no, sir, we won't. And then I looked over at this one named uh, Juarez. I said, and don't take them home with you either. <laughs> oh, no, sir, no, sir. I said, but I'm not going to be responsible for your electric cord because everything that goes over that fence, they think is theirs to eat. So I said, if you can keep it up in the limbs of the trees or something, you'd probably be better off. He said, I did a bill. Chastening should not be joyous, but grievous. You ought to look that word up. Well, I don't mean to trigger some of y'all people in here that was beat as a kid, and I hope you, I hope you know we're just kidding around. We're not, we're not uh, condoning beating, but we are condoning correction. But how many of you, when you was a kid, when you were getting the spanking, you thought you were going to die? I was like, this can't be right, man. You can't beat somebody you love. And then I had a couple of them. I was like, yeah, yeah, you can. 
It's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, I don't know about you, but my, my mom would just beat you with anything, flip-flop, a switch, a whatever, a spatula, rolling pin. She didn't care. But my dad always used his belt. But after he was through, then he always sat there and talked to you and whatever. And it's a weird thing, but you always felt closer to him after the spanking than you did before. I don't know. I think that's what that verse means. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight path for your feet. In other words, if you stay on the straight path, you won't have to be chastened. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. The chastening can heal you. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So he's just setting a little stage here. Uh, look at um, verses uh, 15. Looking diligently lest any man uh, fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, hang on. This is one of the proofs why I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Because he'll, he'll write a verse. He don't ever use a period for chapters and chapters sometimes. But he can write a verse... And you can understand the meaning of every word in that verse, but you can read that verse, and when you get through with that verse, you don't understand the meaning of the verse. And you have to read it over and over and over. That's just one of them. Watch. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. How do you fail because of the grace of God? It doesn't seem to make any sense until you think about it. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. So this failing because of the grace of God is going to cause in you a root of bitterness. Okay? And thereby many be defiled. All right? How could we fail because of the grace of God? After you've been chastened, you might look around and see others that are not. Now let me ask you something. How does the Lord chasten you? What's the primary way that you feel like God corrects you? Because he doesn't necessarily chasten everybody the same way. Do you know children are that way? Some children, all you got to do is look at them with a stern voice and it does the correction. Others, you got to beat them like a horse. But how does he correct you? If you can't readily, you don't have to tell me, what, that's not what we're doing, but if you can't readily come to an answer to that, you might be a bastard. Because if you've not been chasing, then this Bible just said uh, you may not be his. If you're his child, you know exactly how he chastens you. For me, I'll bear my soul. For me, the best way I can describe it is um, I get what I call a smooth feeling. When I am questioned on something I should do or shouldn't do, if it's something, if I have a troubled feeling in my spirit about it, that's God's witness to me, don't do it. If I have a smooth feeling about it, I don't just, I don't do it r real quickly. I wait to see if the devil's trying to deceive me. But if I go ahead and I do something that I knew was wrong, then... Um, the way that God most of the time corrects me is he'll just pull his hand off of me. And I'll, I'll quickly notice 
that I don't have this um, camaraderie with him or this feeling that he's with me or this feeling that he's close, he'll just back off. And that's worse than any beating with a whip you could ever get. But how does he deal with you? Now I want to take you to this and I want you to look at this. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Fail because of the grace, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. So sometimes people, they get bitter because they feel like God's been harsh on them. But other people just seem to be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. Well, one thing, they may not be his child. Second, they may be more obedient than you. Third, they may need more grace of God, which is unmerited favor, to bring them to him. The thing is, you get bitter when you see God doling out grace to people that you deem they're not worthy. And what happens is, is you forget about that you weren't worthy either. So, why are those people blessed and have the grace of God on them? They live like the devil. You might say, they haven't been to church but three times in this whole year, but I'm not keeping track. But I haven't missed a service in 10 years. If you're not careful, you'll get bitter because of the grace of God on other people's lives. Look at Matthew 20. Jesus explained it a lot better than I can. Matthew 20, verse 1. Watch this. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man. Now, right there, we need to establish... This is not the spiritual kingdom. This is not the spiritual kingdom of God. This, Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews about a kingdom to come on the earth. It's a physical, literal, visible. It's got temples. It's got horses. It's got stalls. It's a, it's a kingdom on the earth. It's a military conquered kingdom. Conquers land. So Jesus is doing a parable about it. And when will the Jews see it? In the millennial. Okay? This isn't talking about saved, born-again people after the resurrection in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's spiritual. The kingdom of God cannot be observed. It's spiritual. But the kingdom of heaven is a literal kingdom on the earth. So the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man... That is a householder. So he, he owns his house. Which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into the vineyard. And you'll find out later. He goes out at 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay? He's got to get this crop in. This crop of grapes. So he goes out to the little place and he hires some laborers. 6 o'clock in the morning. Watch. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day... He sent them into his vineyard. Now, in that day, that was a real good wage for a laborer. A hardworking laborer got a penny a day. It, it's not like a penny of ours. It would, um, I used to teach this, $100 a day. Um, I think people make more than that now at uh, uh, McDonald's or something. But let's just say $100 a day, okay? That's the going way. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. He said, okay, we got to get these grapes in. Go get them. And he went out about the third hour, which would be 9 o'clock in the morning, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, these laborer guys. You know, there's places, I don't know about Barsville, but in Tulsa, there's places where people will gather and you can just go pick them up. You'll say, I need a mason. They'll jump in your truck. I need a sheet rocker. The mason will jump in your truck. It doesn't matter, right? And uh, so that's what this sort of is. And he went out about the third hour, 9 o'clock, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He needs some more reapers. 
And he said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth, uh, about the sixth hour, which would be noon, the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, which would be five o'clock, he went out and found others standing idle, and he said unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? And they said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. They're like, Okay. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. Why does he pay the last ones first? And if he did, why is it written in your Bible? Because it's a spiritual law. Jesus talks about it all the time. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Why do you think it's in your Bible? It's in there for you to catch. So they're all standing there. They've got the vineyards all picked clean. The guy has his harvest. He's so excited. And he says to his steward or his boss or who's working for him, I want you to go pay them, but I want you to pay the ones that only worked an hour, I want you to pay them first. Now Jesus is telling this parable, and it's a parable, and Jesus could have made it up. But why does he do that? Because the other people are watching those people watch. And if you're not careful, you get bitter because of the grace shown to other people. Watch. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they worked for one hour, sixty minutes. They received every man a penny. All right, if you started at six o'clock that morning and you see Chet gets a hundred dollars, you're looking over at your friend and say, well, if he paid Chet a hundred bucks for one hour, I wonder what we're going to get. Boy, I don't know if it's going to be good. I guarantee this guy's got a pocket full of money. Watch. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. Everybody got a penny. Everybody got a hundred bucks. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour. Oh, now they become a union. Now they want to start negotiating their pay, right? These last guys, they only worked one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us? Notice, they didn't say you paid them the same as us. They're getting bitter, aren't they? They said you made them, you put them up in the uh, same class as us that worked hard all day long. I'm telling you, it's all right here. Thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, oh man, now that ought to jump off the page at you. I told you about that. Where else is that in the Bible? So Jesus is in Gethsemane and he's got his little entourage with him and coming up the hill there is probably over 1500 men most have torches what does 1500 men look like it looks like 20 times the attendance of Barnstall's Friday night football game that's what it looks like and when they get up there the first thing he says to Judas is friend. <laughs> now you got the Creator God looking at Satan inside of a man, and he calls him friend. 
friend? What are you doing up here? Friend? Who y'all looking for? Does Jesus sound like he's scared? Well, I mean, he's went through a very, you know, terrible time. He's been begging God not to send him to the cross, and then now Luke, you know, Judas comes and betrays him. I really, I really, if you got me down on the floor and twisted my arm up, I think he took the cross and was walking like a, like it was a baton up the hill. I don't think he drugged it. I don't think they got Simon Cyrene to help him because he couldn't carry it. I think they got him so he, he wouldn't be walking or twirling it like a baton. That's just what I think. Most people don't think that because they don't think he was God. Well, you better hope he was. But he answered one of them and he said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? You know all those guys are standing there needing to pay, for, uh, needing to uh, provide for their families and when he came up and picked them, they were glad that they were chosen. And he said, will you guys work hard? I worked a guy the other day and he got ready to get in the car and I said, hold on! And he thought there was a snake in the floorboard and he stopped and he's looking down and he said, what? And I said, do you work hard? And he said, yeah, I work real hard. I said, okay, come on, get in. I said, I don't want to mess with you if you don't work hard. Kind of sets the day, you know. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto me. He said, didn't you want a job this morning at 6 o'clock in the morning? Weren't you standing there begging for a job? Yeah. Weren't you glad when I came up and chose you? You know, God chose each and every one of you. Yeah. Wasn't you excited about getting paid? Yeah. Then why did it change in you when you saw what I, through grace or unmerited favor, gave some people that didn't earn it? That's what grace is. Something you can't earn. He says, take what is thine uh, and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. It is not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own. You know, who are, who are we to start looking at other people and how God deals with them and get bitter? If you don't understand that, go read the book of Job. I've said this before. I feel sorry for Job before God gets through with him. He's like, who do you think you are? No, that's, that's right. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? That's exactly what Hebrews says. If you're not careful, you'll get bitter because you'll see God's grace on other people. After you've been chastised, maybe this don't mean anything to you. It means a lot to me because I was an older brother. And we'd get in trouble, me and my little brother. And he's four years younger than me. And I was just a little kid too. But I might get three licks and he might get one. And I was like, that little sucker started it. And I'd get bitter. And I didn't consider that he was, you know, four years old and I was eight. Maybe you can't relate to it. I can relate to it. He said, uh, in, in your, go back to that verse 15. He says, is your eye evil because I'm good? In other words, you can look at what I'm doing something and you know that's good. You wish you were that man. You wish I'd have seen you an hour ago. But yet it's turned in your eye to evil. Let me tell you something. You'd be walking on water, Christian, if you can work from six to six and see a guy that only worked one hour and be happy for him. But that's the goal. That's the goal. And Jesus said in the kingdom of heaven on the earth, that's the way people are going to be. 
they're going to be happy for you. They're going to be like, hey, hey, man, you got paid the same as I did. You'd be happy for them. Listen, it ain't going to hurt. It ain't going to give you no more money to be um, hating on them. Listen, we're all old enough. We ought to be pretty mature in this Christian walk. Yesterday, Rocky was building my pad for my building, and Diana's got Peggy hooked on this glass stuff like a some kind of drug fiend or something. So Peggy thinks she's got to supply this, you know, ladies thing. So she sends me a text, and she found an antique place in Pahuska. And I guess I got to go burn that place down or something. But she said, hey, I found all these glass and stuff I needed. And so I told little Randy, little Randy's there. I said, little Randy, I'm going to give you a marriage counseling lesson right now. I said, see here, ain't going to do me no good. She's already bought it. I mean, ain't going to do me no good to act a fool. So I said, watch, watch the master at work. He's like, oh, okay. And so I said, I am so happy that you found some more stuff to buy that you needed. Maybe when you get home tonight, we can look on the Internet and you can find some more. <laughs> That's as true as I can put it out, man. Look at verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few are chosen. Now what? Well, I want to know, what do you think that verse means? Let's, let's look at it again. So the last shall be first. Well, we understand that. And the first last. For many be called, but few are chosen. In this parable, who's the called? Who's the chosen? There's your homework. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this group of people. Thank you for this church. God, and we pray again that you bless our efforts in this uh, ladies' conference. We pray that you send those ladies from the north and the south and the east and the west. Uh, we pray this church is just flooded with ladies and the ministry flows. They are encouraged when they go home. They'll be better wives, better mothers, better daughters, better sisters and just all around encouraged in the word of the Lord. God, thank you for the opportunity to minister on your behalf. We just sing uh, praises to you, and we ask you to touch everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. We're going to move some tables if you can help us. With